Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. And I hope that you can hear me well. All right. Now, for me to know that you're hearing me well, because I'm not home in Freeport. I'm out over here in Nassau, Bahamas, doing the Renew, Rebuild, and Restore conference. So my setup is different. <laughs> okay. So if you can hear me, just say, Kevin, I can hear you clearly before I start going on and only me can hear me. <laughs> okay. So I just need you to confirm that you can hear me, all right? That's it. And once you would have done that, let me just check all of my social media stuff here. Okay, good. Alicia Sandy said, I can hear you. Very clear, beautiful. Okay, because I'm using these earphones here. You know, showing off a little bit here. So I gotta make sure I show off, I do this thing right, <laughs> okay? So currently I'm in Nassau, Bahamas, all right? Um, doing the uh, the guest speaker for the Renew, Rebuild, and the Restore uh, conference. And last night, we had a very, very powerful, marvelous teaching. And of course, the topic here is identifying and addressing the invisible yokes. And basically, what this is about is where we focus on the things that we cannot see, which becomes yokes in our lives, things that we have unknowingly either joined ourselves to or has become joined to us. As a result of that, you know, I make this statement all the time that your connection will now determine your direction. In the case of an invisible yoke, you don't even know it's there. You have no idea. And the job of this invisible yoke, in order, in order for it to remain in your life and to succeed in keeping you back in life is to always cause you to focus on everything else except it, all right? And we gave several examples last night. One of those invisible yokes is the spirit of infirmity. For example, in uh, Luke 13, this lady was going to this particular church for 18 years, and she had this condition with her bent over, all right? For 18 years, she's coming there, going through the regular... Uh, services and different stuff that they had going on, regular church tradition, paying tithe, giving offering, all of that stuff, but never was healed. Not knowing that there was something attached to a, a yoke. And what is a yoke? Well, literally a yoke is a device that is placed on the neck of two animals, probably cows, donkeys, horses, or whatever. And this other device is attached to it to assist the farmer in plowing that land, right? Well, the biblical and spiritual version of that yoke represents bondage, meaning that there is a force on you. There is an entity that has you uh, limited in a certain area. So you're yoked to it. And the purpose of the yoke, the more you look at the definition, whatever is yoke, then there's a, there's a slave master relationship, meaning that the one who is yoked would be the slaves, and the one who's controlling the yoke would be the master. So in Luke 13, we're told about the story where Jesus is in the synagogue teaching and he identified this woman. And he, he sees a yoke that none of the leaders sees, saw, none of the followers, members, visitors saw. So after 18 years of going to this place, he said, hey, you have, listen to what he says, a spirit of infirmity. So Jesus identified, okay, the spirit, the yoke, and now he's going to address it. So clearly he didn't come to play church. He, he, he recognized that I, 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 I see something nobody else sees here. I see something on you, yoke to you, okay? And the, the, the etymology of the word yoke literally means to join or to tie. In other words, to connect. So what was connected to her was dictating the course of her destiny, and she didn't even know. It caused her to be incapacitated in such a state that she was limited in certain functions or many functions. Many of you have that. You are yoked to uh, a bad relationship. You are yoked to some form of drug, alcohol, sexual immorality, whatever it is. But the thing about being yoked, and this is what makes those spirits so stealth, it makes you a functioning uh, uh, slave. 
Meaning that you go above with your regular life. Why? Because what you're yoked to is in a physical form standing in front of you, looking at you. Okay, I see this is depression because it has the legs, the arms, and furthermore, it has a label that says depression. You don't see that. You don't see the other force over here, what has what is yoked to you, this yoke of addiction, addiction to procrastination, addiction to uh, whatever it is that is keeping you from whatever you're supposed to be doing because you don't see it. So the invisible yokes are those demon, unclean spirits, those entities that are a part of your life, but you're still functioning in certain areas. So even though you know there's something wrong, you're still going for just like an addict, a functioning addict. They could snort cocaine, smoke drugs, drink alcohol, and still manage to function properly or to an acceptable degree, not to be labeled as an addict. So the invisible yoke is what a lot of people have, especially more importantly, church people, right? They have this invisible yoke. So what I'm going to do is just give you these uh, five points that I gave to recognize that there's an invisible yoke in your life. And then I'm going to jump into uh, today's teaching, okay? So I told last, last night to the audience the five the five major signs, the five major signs that there is an invisible yoke. And you know what I'm going to do for you after this conference, probably sometime down in the uh, couple of weeks from now, I'll actually do this teaching live. Okay. But five major signs of an invisible yoke. The number one sign. The, how do I know there's an invisible yoke in my life? Jesus was able to recognize the invisible yoke in the lady's life in Luke uh, 13, the woman who had the spirit of infirmity, okay? Meaning that he's seeing from a spiritual lens, from a spiritual perspective, I'm seeing what no one else could see. So what is the major, the major sign? Because I wrote down five. There are many, but these are the five most predominant ones. The number one is difficulty in doing what is right. Difficulty in doing what is right you find it extremely hard to do, okay? And each one of them I gave a scripture for. This one here is Romans 7, 14 to 24. Romans 7, 14 to 24. Paul, this great man of God who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, okay? He had invisible yokes he was dealing with. And the invisible yokes was preventing him, and that's the purpose of them, to prevent you from doing what you are called to do, to prevent you from doing what you're supposed to do, obeying the laws of God, okay? Adhering to his rules and laws and principles, uh, seeking him to fulfill your destiny, doing what you're supposed to do, going out there preaching. In other words, what an invisible yoke is, what an invisible yoke would do is confine you to a system or a tradition that the system or the tradition you're attached to that their praises of you, their applauding and promoting of you is sufficient. But none of this, or it is substandard to what God requires. So in your mind, I'm doing the will of God because I'm following this system that has nothing to do with the genuine standards of God. So you find all your life, the Bible says, you're ever learning but never coming into the truth. So you're following a system that you, you, you cannot ever do what God has called you to do. So in, in the scripture I just gave you for the number one, the number one uh, major sign of invisible yokes in your life is difficulty in doing what is right. Paul said, I try to do right, but I end up doing wrong. And then he says in verse 21 and verse 23, verse 21, he says of Romans 7, I find in a law that whenever I attempt to do what is right, I find in a law that whenever I attempt to do what is right, watch this, watch this, evil or an invisible yoke is present with me. That is what is stopping me. Then in verse 23, say, I find then another law in my flesh, meaning that even though my inward man want to do the will of God, but there's something that I cannot see that's stopping me. You've got an invisible yoke in your life. And the purpose and the success and the longevity of this yoke in your life is to keep you looking, focusing, arguing, doing Focus on everything else, but don't you ever come into the realization that there is a spirit of poverty on you. There's a spirit of jealousy. There's a spirit of backwardness. There's a spirit of frustration because these are all invisible yokes. 
These are all invisible yokes that you cannot see. Okay, number two, five major signs of invisible yokes in your life. Number two is addiction. You're addicted to doing the same thing over and over and over again, even though it's not working. You know, you know it ain't working, but you're doing it over and over. And the scripture that I had for that, where is it now? Was First Corinthians 10, verse 13. First Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. And listen what it says. It says, there have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able, but will, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear. So what does this mean? I so love this. And when I released this last night, it was just so impactful to so many listening. Okay, so we would recognize that there's an invisible yoke in our life, meaning that there are spirits which whom are invisible, pulling the strings to our lives. And I'm talking to believers in particular. They have a right to do it to sinners. And I'm talking about believers now, that you could still be a Christian, but the areas that you're challenging, uh, the areas that you're challenging, it is a challenged in, it's an indicator that there is an invisible yoke. So if addiction is the number two greatest sign of invisible yoke, God says in the scripture we just read, 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, that, hey, look, there is no temptation that could come upon a human being that God will not assist. And how does he assist? He makes a way of escape. But the invisible yoke of addiction says, yeah, the escape is there, but don't take it because this over here is better. And why is he doing that? To keep you in that addictive cycle. The opportunity is God. Listen, let's read this again. He's God said here, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there had no temptation taken you but such are as common. There is no temptation that could ever challenge a human being that is not common with all mankind. There is never a special temptation that came about that was never, ever introduced to the world. That is what he's saying. They had no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But listen where God says he will intervene. But God is faithful, meaning you can put a guarantee on this. God is faithful. Who will not suffer? That word means to allow. Who will not allow you to be tempted above that ye are able? God says, I will never let a sexual temptation, a drug temptation, uh, whatever has come upon you that you are not able to deal with. And in other words, I will assist you in this area, sinner or saint. I'm helping you to make the right decision by setting a standard as to how the enemy could possibly tempt you. So he says here, who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but with, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So God says every temptation, first of all, he says there's no temptation that is not coming to all man. That's number one. Number two, he says there's none that I will allow to have such a power over your will that you're not able to be able to make the right decision. He said, in that case, I will intervene and, and say, look here, Satan, there's a standard here. Only so much you could tempt Kevin. And he says, even while I'm doing that, I'm now creating a space for Kevin to run. He says, see, Kevin, come here. Take this back door right here. But Kevin is so indoctrinated. Kevin so loves his sin that Kevin says, oh, God, I see all of the help you're trying to give me. And yeah, this isn't a common temptation. I've seen this before, and yeah, you said the standard, and Satan is agreeing with you, and yeah, you have the bond open for me to run, but I don't want to take it. I don't want to take it, not today, not tomorrow, not day after tomorrow, not 10 years from now. Addiction, addiction. So the invisible yoke, the sign of it, number two, addiction. I'm addicted to failure. I'm addicted to not achieving. Even though I'm complaining, even though I'm telling everybody how, you know, the devil this, the government that, the church this, and Kevin that, but I refuse to make the necessary changes to get up out of this. In fact, every door got open for me to go, I said, no, you better, you better close that door because I can go the other way. Number three, the third major sign of invisible yoke is being inconsistent. Being inconsistent. You know, I just did a teaching with this uh, two days ago, being inconsistent. And the scripture I used for that was James chapter 1, verse 8. 
a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's how you know there's an invisible force in your life. You thinking you just lousy, you curse him. Yeah, well, if you curse, that means there are an abundance of invisible yokes. See, it's tied itself to you, but you don't know. However, this union, unfortunately for you, is determining your direction. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you, all right? Number four, the four major signs of invisible yokes. Always living in and off the past. People who are bound, people who are yoked to evil spirits, they will all, the spirit will always remind them of who they used to be or what they used, never pressing forward, never saying, you know what, my focus is becoming X, Y, Z. Let me run forward. When you see this, then you automatically know, excuse me, you automatically know that there, excuse me, is an invisible yoke in your life. So the scripture I gave for this was Philippians 3, 13 to 14, Philippians 3, 13 to 14. Okay, and it says, brethren, I count not myself. This is Paul speaking to the church of Philippia, whatever, Philippians. I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Who's I? Paul. Forgetting those things which are where? Which are where? Behind. I'm not interested in what used to happen. I'm not going to feel guilty for what I already did in the past that was not right, that I've already gotten forgiveness for. I'm not going to have no condemnation holding me down. He says, but this one thing I do, I, Paul, do this, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press towards the what the mark. He has an established goal. He has an established goal, pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Number five, the fifth major sign of invisible yokes in your life. Unnatural restrictions, rejections, blockages, delays. If you see any of these things in your life, then there are invisible yokes in your life, meaning that these things are not just happening by accident. There are forces, demonic forces, evil spirits, unclean spirits, however you want to label them, that are yoked or assigned to your life. They're tied to you. And they're the puppet masters pulling the strings to you, the puppet. Okay, so wherever you see blockages, especially if it's on a consistent basis, trust me, my friend, there's a yoke in your life, okay? And the scripture that I used for this one that I thought was very, very uh, powerful was 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, okay? So Paul now speaking to the church of uh, Thessalonians or whatever, right? He says, so being, 1 Thessalonians 2 and 8, so being affectionately, uh, no, I think I have the wrong one. Is it right? First Thessalonians 2, verse 18, sorry. <laughs> First Thessalonians 2, verse 18, not verse 8. First Thessalonians 2, verse 18. Paul says, wherefore ye would have come, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul. So Paul is telling them, listen, Church of Thessalonians, we are here now, right? But we would have been here early, you know, me and my crew, especially me. Even if they didn't come, I would have been here earlier. But watch what he says next. Wherefore we come, wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once again. So he's saying, I was here before, and clearly he would have promised that he would have come back again. And he said, I would have come back or I would have been here earlier. Listen, listen. But Satan hindered us. So do you believe that Satan personally showed up, the spirit Satan, with the however we imagine him to be, literally showed up every attempt that Paul and his crew wanted to go to, to Thessalonica. No. What he's saying, whatever stopped us, whatever hindered us, whatever delayed us, Satan or the evil spirits or the invisible yokes were behind it. In other words, Paul was saying, the physical things that stopped us from coming, whatever, the, 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 the donkey card wheel fell apart, the donkey was sick, it was too hot. To, whatever the reason was, he says the source behind it were invisible yokes. Invisible yokes simply means specific spirit signs to a person, causing them not to achieve what they are supposed to be achieving in life. Simple. So they the five. That's what I ended with last night. But of course, we had an intense teaching on everything. Uh, I think we recorded. I'm not sure. But in any event, we did not minister this later on. Uh, in the future, okay? 
So with that said, I want to quickly jump into our topic today. Our topic is the number one sign of success during and after fasting. This is something that I get all the time. And remember, I'm telling you these things about fasting so much because we're going into next month and we go in full sale because Kevin is telling you all the do's, the don'ts, what to expect, what not to expect, blah, 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 whatever the case may be. And in this particular teaching right now, I want to show you the number one sign, the number one sign of success during and after fasting. But before I do that, you see, I have you on my screen, the definition of the word reinforce, okay? The definition of the word reinforce. To reinforce something means to make something stronger or more pronounced. In other words, to encourage it to the point or to support it to have a better chance for success, okay? If, if I'm weak in math, okay, the, or my kids are weak in math or whatever, okay, what I would do to reinforce or to aid them to be better, then I would get a tutor. Or I would get some teacher who specializes in math to do an afternoon class or whatever. So to reinforce means to provide additional strength so that this person would be better or to improve. That's the whole purpose of it. All right. And this word, the reason why I'm defining it is because this is going to be the keynote speaker to where I'm going to go today. Okay. So again, our topic today is the number one sign of success during and after fasting. Now, when people go on a fast, a genuine one, and I'm going to tell you why I say genuine. If you decide to go on a fast, and during the time of that fast, there is no opposition. There is no feeling sick, or there's no hunger, there's no family problems, the car didn't break down, the burners on the stove still working, uh, and all kind of great things. Nothing went wrong. This was during and after the fast. Well, I am here to tell you that fast was not successful. I am here to tell you, you need to reconsider if you really went on a fast. Why? Because as you're about to read, it is literally impossible, literally impossible for you to go on a genuine fast and there be no opposition in your life. And not just opposition, but intense opposition. In other words, what you're saying to me is, Kevin, you know what? When I went on the fast, Satan cooperated. He said, you know what? Because you're such a beautiful child of God and you're reaching so many people, I am not going to allow myself and my imps and my evil forces and principalities to hinder you. I'm going to let you get on with the will of God. That's what you are. That is what I interpret when you say to me, Kevin, I don't know what these people are talking about, but I never had a problem on my fast. That is what I hear, which is utter rubbish. Now, why is there an intense fight during and after fast? Simple. The purpose of your fasting is to undo the spiritual evil that is going on in your life. So, meaning that if there are forces such as poverty, such as lack, or whatever the case in your life, these are who is initiating this? Evil spirits. Evil spirits are initiating this. So therefore, they're comfortable. They didn't have no resistance. They were quite comfortable in your life. Invisible yokes, they're quite comfortable. When you go on a genuine fast, what you're doing now is bringing in reinforcement or beseeching the throne of God to, hey, look, I've had enough of the spirit of poverty. I've had enough of the spirit of lust. I need heaven's help to come and help me. So as a result, the help is going to come and therefore, the kingdom of darkness is going to, listen, listen, reinforce their efforts. In other words, hey, guys, we need help. These people are trying to evict us from our home. So this is why everything goes haywire, because Satan, number one tool in the spiritual as well as the physical realm, whenever there's an intense fight, okay? The first method that they're going to use to shut down this fight early is to do the same thing they're doing now in the natural. And what is that, Mr. Ewing? Change the narrative. If we could get them to change the narrative, we have just achieved them changing the focus on why they're fighting to begin with. So this is why all of a sudden, your baby daddy acting up and he don't want to pay the child support, knowing that things tough for you and you don't have a job right now. This is why ever since you started the fast, your car stopped working. And the boss already told you, if you are late one more time, you are fired. This is why everything is breaking down, because the enemy is trying to get you so uh, 
focus on these things, not the fast anymore, because this fast is causing us to be evicted. So in order for us to have a fighting chance, we need to distract you. So this is the purpose for the intensity of when the time you went on that fast and even after the enemy is trying to distract you. He's trying to change the narrative. Same thing today, we see it all the time, okay? We say there are two genders, male and female, okay? And then we come in with all of this other garbage that we know don't make no sense, and we know don't make sense, but yet we're still arguing with them. We're still running over them, pulling us away from what we know to be truth. What is it again? Distraction. What is it again? Changing the narrative to get me to focus on foolishness as opposed to what I know to be facts. So I'm wasting time. I'm wasting time over here with this nonsense. And it's the same thing with a fast. If I can only get them to focus on every time they go on a fast, the wife acting up, the husband acting up, the children acting up. They can't say, you know what? Now that I don't see what, what goes on with this, I don't care what my wife does. I don't care what my husband does, okay? Whatever they do, that's on them. I am going to stay focused. I am going to stay focused on my agenda. Let me just turn on my ear here a second. I am going to stay focused on my agenda and I don't care what the enemy does because I know this guy is here to try to discourage me, to try to derail me, to try to, 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 to cause me not to stay focused on what I'm supposed to be doing, okay? So with the word reinforcement, because we're going to pound on this before we get into the main text. Again, to reinforce means to make something stronger because clearly there was some form of weakness. So we need more help. We need more strength. Okay. So let's apply for scripture to show you how these evil forces operate. Okay. In the spiritual realm. Okay. When they're either being evicted or if they were evicted and trying to regain entry, because what you have done is you have literally eradicated them from what they literally call their territory, their home, because they've been there for so long. So if you evict them, that don't mean they're not gonna come back or they have every right to come back. And if you're evicting them, these are the two cases in which they will intensify their efforts. So again, let me be clear, when you go on that fast next month, or even if you're fasting now, or you fasted before this, if you said to me, there was no form of opposition during your fasting, my sister, my brother, you were not on a genuine fast, which you were on a, a weight loss plan. That's what you were doing. Okay, so let's look at our first scripture. So our first scripture, only two scriptures we're going to use in this text, okay, in this teaching. The first scripture we're going to look at is Mark, sorry, Matthew 12, Matthew chapter 12, and we're going to look at verse 43 to verse 45. And this is Jesus speaking, and he's giving us some spiritual insight into how the opposing force in the spiritual world, how they operate, respond, particularly when it comes to them being eradicated, when it comes to them being challenged. There's a specific protocol way that they will behave. And he's giving us this deep insight. So now when we face these things, we don't listen to mumbo jumbo people telling us, what we listen to is what Jesus would have said. Okay, what was Jesus' stance on this? What was his protocols? What was his rules? So watch this. And again, it's all up to do with reinforcement. So in Matthew 12, beginning at verse 43, it says, Jesus speaking. Jesus says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he, which is the unclean spirit, walks through dry places seeking rest, but finds none. So we realize that once this evil spirit has been dethroned or eradicated out of a person's life, then immediately they go to see if they can inhabit the life of somebody else. Dry places simply mean another human being who is depleted or void of God, meaning that they have no relationship with him. So this spirit is looking for someone else to possess. If the one who they want to possess meets the qualifications to be possessed, they just can't possess them. They have to be in gross violation of the laws of God that will give them the right. How do you know this, Kevin? I know this because Deuteronomy 28 verse 15 says to me, if thou will not observe to do, if thou will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God and observe to do all his commandments, then shall these curses come, or then shall these evil invisible forces come upon you. Meaning that they must meet a particular criteria or criterion to enter this poison. They just cannot jump on you. Again, this is how this is why you appreciate rules. Because in all of these things, physical or even uh, uh, 
spiritual. There are rules. This is why I keep pushing this. There are rules that once I know the rules, I have nothing to fear because if I'm operating in the rules, the spirit cannot come beyond these rules. This, the Bible says that the word of God uh, shall not return void. He had placed it above his name. Heaven and earth shall pass away before any of his words shall not manifest with its promise. So if this is what God says, then that spirit, as much as it hates God, as much as it hates me, it must submit to the laws, the rules, and the principles of God. And this is why I teach you to focus on those things, the laws, the rules, and the principles of God. So Jesus says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he which is the unclean spirit walks into dry places, seeking rest, but finds none. Listen, verse 44 of Mark 12. Then he says, who is he? The evil spirit that was evicted. Okay. He says, I will return into my house. So you see these spirits, they are all about ownership. If I, the spirit of poverty, was yoked to Kevin, and Kevin came here and eradicated me, some deliverance minister who understand the rules, or even Kevin himself through self-deliverance, eradicated me, then immediately, because I cannot immediately jump back on him, I need to go look to find another spot to inhabit. But wherever I go, I'm going to call that my home. So after the spirit realized that I couldn't find an available agent or another house, quote unquote, let me go back to my residence. Let me go back to my former apartment, my former house. And this is how the spirit sees the one they once inhabited or even the one who they want to inhabit. This is my property. So now you see why the fight is so intense during and after fasting because you are evicting this spirit that has been stealthily in your life for ages. I don't care nobody tell you. So it's a, it's a matter of ownership and, a, and, 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 and authority over this human vessel. Yeah, Kevin, yeah, this is your body and all that, but the truth is this is my body. I was in, when I was in you, in terms of the spirit of lust and the spirit of defeat and all that, man, I own you. And you go and mess around and come into this knowledge and evict me. No homeboy. I go looking for another place. But if I can't find none, I come in back to repossess my property. Jesus is giving these super, super rules. Just as he said, look at even though y'all can't see it, I am telling you how these things work. But watch this more revelation. It was 44 of Matthew 12. Then he, which is the evil spirit that was evicted, said, I will return into my house, ownership. From whence I came out. And when the spirit came back, he found it, meaning that the soulish state, the inner man, the spirit man of this person, he found it swept, kept, and garnished, meaning that prior to deliverance, you are filthy on the inside because this nasty, evil spirit, no matter what type of spirit it is, and what when you think of messy and filthy, what do you think of? Because it's now going to give the basis of all spirit confusion. But when I'm delivered, there's a cleaning up that takes place on the inside. So the spirit comes back and says, okay, hold on. There's no more filth in there. There's no more garbage in there. I can't get in there because the premises in which I got in the first time is because there was something in there that gave me the legal right to go to be there. Remember when Jesus was talking to, I don't know, Luke or not Luke, uh, one of the disciples. And he says how the, the evil one, Satan, is going to come to visit him. But watch what he says next. But Satan will find no iniquity in me. There is nothing when he shows up here that will give him the right to come in me. In other words, again, Jesus is showing this powerful correlation of covenants that there must be something about you. There must be something in you. There must be something in your bloodline, something that this particular spirit have the right to dominate you, have the right to enter you, have the right to rule you. In other words, nothing is happening by accident. Nothing is happening by chance. These are things that you must know as a believer because you could be pulled into the, 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 the fanatic and foolish and stupid world of giving monies to get rid of these things. Or once I give money, these rules will just fall in place. That is utter garbage. You need to know how to make applicable the available tools as well as rules to dominate your enemy. And that your enemy will always be under your feet, despite how much he's kicking up and screaming. Stay here behind right under my feet. You will go no further. Why? 
because I'm exercising the infallible unadulterated word of God. This is in my opinion. These are my rules. I am exercising the rules that will always give me success in the end. I'm not depending on no money I sold. I'm not depending on how I help a pastor. I'm not depending because whatever. I'm doing it according to the rules. And whatever spirit come up against me, homeboy, my application of these rules have placed an invisible barrier around me. You got to submit, even, you, even though you don't want to. You huffy and puffy, and you wish you could tear my head off. But guess what? The rules check you right at the door. And this is where I want you to be, right there. So watch this. He says that now that the spirit came back and realized that there's no filth in this man, meaning that it doesn't mean that the man is perfect. He probably messed up after deliverance, but he understood repentance. He better be repented. And the rule says that you confess your sins. God is faithful and just not only to forgive you, but to cleanse you of all unrighteousness, meaning moving any filth that will give that spirit the right. Watch 44, because this is where I wanted us to get to. After the spirit realized that he didn't get back in, what did he do? Because you're going to see how intelligent, how brilliant these evil forces from the time they all were kicked out of heaven. They, 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 when it comes to planning, strategy, and so on, these guys master it. However, no matter what plan they come up with, it can never outplan or outcalculate God's original rules. So in verse 45 of Matthew 12, it says, then go with he, then go with who? The spirit. Because remember in verse 43, Jesus is saying, when he's evicted, what is his first response? He goes seeking another vessel. Dry places, I'm looking for another. Dry simply means that there's no, nothing of God there. Now that he didn't get nothing, when he went out there looking after he eradicated, verse 44 says, he says, okay, well, let me go back to my house. He's still calling the person he was eradicated of his own home. So he goes back there and see that this guy is living right and doing what is right, repenting. He say, wow. So what does he do now? He goes for reinforcement. That's what you do. Whenever I can beat up this fellow, I got some bigger brothers who will put a weapon on him. So let me go get some reinforcement who will make this fellow subdue, who will make this fellow bend. So verse 45 of Matthew 12 says, then go with the spirit then goes and take it with himself seven other spirits you're not going to see them coming seven other spirits more wicked than himself more wicked than the original spirit y'all listen to this so let me see if i get this right here and you i think i get what you're saying you're saying the reason why so much hell is happening during my fast. The reason why all hell break loose after my fast. You saying that the original spirit was eradicated and this clown went and get seven more far greater than him. And they are responsible for all this hell breaking loose. You're getting it. I love it. Come to the voice of the class. You're getting it. Come straight to the front of the class. You're getting it now. Now you see why I said to you, nothing is happening by mistake. I mean, all of this craziness that's going on now that you, you're even in the, some of you are in the planning stages. Yeah, Kevin, you even posted on my, my Facebook pages and so on. You showed me, you got the copy of my prayer book. You showed me the Bible promises book and you say, Kevin, I ready. And you realize you haven't even started the fast yet and hell already start to break loose. Why? Because these brothers know what they, they know the whipping, the whooping they're about to get right now because you are about to inculcate and to execute the rules, not your opinion. You are about to execute the rules that they already know. If these people follow through and they're consistent with what they're being told about the word of God concerning fasting, they know that they will start a chance. So now you see all of a sudden, your belly extra hungry now, and you don't even start the fast yet. All of a sudden, all your finances go in wire. They're trying to discourage you. Again, change the narrative. So the scriptures are unequivocally clear. Verse 45 says of Matthew 12, then go with the evil spirit and take it with himself. Excuse me. Seven other spirits more, more, meaning increase, more wicked than himself. Uh-huh. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be. 
also unto the wicked generation. So Jesus just gave us a handful of information there. He says, don't you ever allow somebody to convince you or even yourself that because everything is going in the opposite direction during my fast, before my fast, or after my fast, don't ever chalk that up as defeat. Don't ever chalk that up as, man, I know I shouldn't mess with this. Everything going wrong for me. Stop it. Stop it. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And what did I tell you in my last teaching? Be consistent. I don't care what breaking out on the back end. Father, I can keep pushing. I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to keep pushing. I know while I may not feel like pushing, I'm going to continue to quote the word of God over and over and over again. I'm going to keep doing it. Why? Because I just how these, these invisible powers are, they understand the law of consistency. Well, I get on board with that too. I'm going to be consistent, right? So with those rules in place, now let's bring this baby home. I'm about to wrap up right now, okay? I'm about to wrap up right now. I, I, I promised myself, I didn't promise you this. I promised myself I'm going to be under an hour in this teaching, okay? Because, of course, I got a teaching to the conference tonight, and I need to uh, be prepared for all of that, okay? So let's go now to Daniel. I'm gonna, everything that I just told you, we're going to bring it all together now. So let's go to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10, okay? And we're going to see all of this in motion, okay? Now watch this now. I want you to listen carefully as I read this. But I want you to listen being equipped with the rules, the laws, and the principle governing spiritual beings, particularly demonic ones, as stated in Matthew 12, 43 to 45. Okay? Because that's going to be... See, this is why you know the Word of God is real. The Word of God is real because whatever rules you see in this Bible, it should be consistent from Genesis to Revelation. You can't come and change nothing. You can't say, well, oh, yeah, say that over here, but blah, 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 unless there was an amendment, okay? That's why I tell people, when you come to me, come to me with either scripture verbatim, and if it isn't verbatim, because not everything is verbatim, then show me the principle that this is standing on that is consistent with Genesis to Revelation. There are certain things the Bible will not verbatim say, okay? It will never verbatim say it. However, you say that it's wrong. Okay, maybe it is. So show me the principle that it stands on that you saw in the Bible and that throughout Scripture I can see the same principle because that's the only way we're going to convince me. But you can't tell me you feel a certain way and this how it should be. You wait, I stop listening to you after that. So let's go to Daniel chapter 10. Listen to this. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And he, which is Daniel, understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. Okay, so clearly this is a vision now, verse 2 of Daniel 10. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three whole weeks. In other words, he was fasting. This is key. Daniel is fasting for three solid weeks, okay? Watch the details of this fast, verse 3 of Daniel 10. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh or wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now, I, I want to point this out because there are those who will come talk mess to care, but no, don't listen to garbage. Well, you know, y'all are too religious. Fasting isn't only not eating. You could stop watching TV. Where was Daniel 75-inch plasma TV that he stopped watching for three weeks? Huh? Show to me. Where was his Nintendo that he didn't use for three weeks? Show to me. Please show to me. Show it to me. The scriptures are clear in regards to fasting. There must be a, de a, a deprivation of food. Minimum, you make it use the water or not, but definitely there should be a pushing away of the plate. Show me where Daniel did not use his cell phone in three weeks and say he's fasting. Try that, boy. You think you're talking about? Get out of here, that garbage. The devil is using you. And I'm not listening to you. So watch this. So verse 3 says, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Watch this. And in the four and twenty day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hedekil, then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen. Now, let me be clear. 
okay? From this point forward, every other person you hear other than Daniel is not a human being. In fact, and I'm gonna preempt this, the only human in this story, the only flesh and blood human being in Daniel 10 will be Daniel himself. The rest are all spiritual beings. So in this vision that Daniel is having, and again, a vision is where you are fully conscious. However, you begin to see supernatural stuff that other people don't see, okay? So verse five says, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold a certain man clothed in linen whose loins were girded with fine gold of your face. His body also was like the barrel and his face as the appearance of lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire. Clearly this is not a human. His eyes are lamps of fire and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Now you all see what happened here, right? This could not be a human being, but don't let's run away from the narrative. What has provoked all of this? Daniel's fasting. Everything was smooth sailing before this brother decide to challenge the spiritual realm with reinforcement, which is what? Fasting. But Kevin, how could, I hear you said that reinforcement is used when the devil come in to fight thing, but what you mean you reinforcement is when we fast because the Bible gave us another tip, Matthew 17, 21, when the disciples could not cast this evil spirit of this particular boy. And so the man took the boy to Jesus. And long story short, Jesus says, the reason why y'all couldn't cast, one of the reasons why y'all couldn't cast this particular spirit off, because this kind, watch this, this kind, and only come with true prayer and fasting. In other words, you got to reinforce what you already did. You've been praying all along, nothing changed. So now you got to engage spiritual forces now. So bring the fasting. The fasting is going to now invite your spiritual help to aid or reinforce you to challenge, to, to succeed over that. I try to help you. I try to help you. See, I love rules. See, Kevin, you never pull that load no hat. I given you the rules step by step by step. I ain't telling you nothing of my opinion. I'm giving you the rules to follow if it is your intent to be set successful in your fast next month or anytime you fast. I ain't telling you so, no see. I ain't telling you none of that. No clots, no oils, none of that. I give it to you raw. This is how you do it. Okay? Watch this. So he goes on to say here in verse 6, his body, meaning that this spiritual being that he saw, also was like the barrel and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in colors to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Verse 7 of Daniel 10. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. That's right, because it was only for you, even though there are others standing next to him. For I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men, for the men that were with me, the other humans that were with him didn't see this. The men that were with me, saw not the vision, but a great quake or earthquake fell upon them so that they scattered. They, there was an earthquake that took place and they ran all of this because of Daniel fast. All of what is happening physically was because of the hell, what, the, the, what break loose in the spiritual realm? These were the physical effects of it. Again, even more empirical evidence. If you are catching hell while you are fasting, and hell further break loose after the fast, you on the right path, my friend. I know it's it taken me long to get to that one point, but let me just jump ahead of myself. You are on the right path. You are doing everything right. If that man left you, if the woman left you, if they fired you, and all of this hell break loose during the fast, two thumbs up. I know you don't like it, but trust me, this is the physical evidence of what's going on in the spiritual realm. The war against the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness on your behalf. I try to help you here. So watch this now. Daniel alone, he said, I saw this. Verse seven, and I, Daniel alone, saw the vision for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quake fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone and saw the great vision and there remained no strength in me for my calmliness or my calmness was turned in me into corruption. And I retain no strength. That's how weak he became based on the supernatural stuff he was being exposed to. Verse 9. Yet heard I the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, this is the spiritual being now. 
Then was I in a deep sleep on my face and my face towards the ground. It's almost as if this voice hypnotized him to the point where he became unconscious. But watch verse 10. And behold, a hand touched me. Again, this is not a human hand. This is that spiritual being he just described. Behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palm of my hands. Verse 11 of Daniel 10. And he, which is the spiritual being that he described earlier, and he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. Oh, hallelujah, listen to this. He said, I have come here specifically for you, all because of you go all messed around with that fast. Oh, what's this verse 11 again? And he said unto me, the spiritual being that is, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling because he couldn't believe what he is being exposed to. Verse 12 of Daniel 10. Then said he, the spiritual being, unto me, Daniel, fear not, Daniel, for, listen carefully, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understanding and to chasten thyself before the Lord, excuse me, thy words were heard, and I am come to thy words. He says, from the first day, Daniel, the first day you started this fast, the first day God sent me. The first day God sent me. Well, what stop you there? That should be your next question. If the first day, he says, Daniel, from the first day you started this fast, God heard you and immediately sent me, sent me. Watch this. Verse 12. Then, then said he, the spiritual being unto me, Daniel, fear not. Daniel, fear not, Daniel, for thou, from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, meaning fasting, and to chasten thyself before the Lord thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come now for thy words. Okay, so if God sent you from the first day of the 21 days Daniel was fasting, spiritual being, then what stop you? And he's about to explain it in verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, hold on, is he referring to the physical human prince? Impossible, can't be. Not based on what we're about to read next. But before we go to let me preempt it, remember what I said to you in many of my teachers. Whenever you see the word principality in the Bible, principality is not a person. Okay? When people say it, they say it as if it's a person. Principality is a position that is held by a prince. Let's be clear there. So when he said the prince of Persia, the prince of Persia was the demonic principality position that that prince held over Persia, which would have been Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Kyrgyzstan, all them other places. This chief spirit, who was right under Satan, was the only person the principality remained answered to was Satan himself. And this one was to ensure that none of God's plan and purposes to mankind be fulfilled. So according to the scriptures, when this messenger angel came from God, to bring this information to Daniel from the first day of his fast, the prince of Persia stopped it. It was because of this fight, and so another character is going to be added, that caused all of this happening again. It is only more proof. It is only more proof that whenever, when you start a genuine fast, during and particularly after, you're going to face the most opposition. Things are going to get worse before they get better, but it is a good sign because it's an indicator that you're on the right track and you're doing the right things. The only thing you need to do now, the only other rule you need to adhere to is what, Kevin? Consistency. To be consistent. Don't pollute what you're already doing. Be consistent in what you're doing. I love it. I love it. So verse 13 says, but the prince, so the messenger angel is saying that the prince of Persia. Now, let's be clear. See, you, you need to understand rules to understand the story. Listen to this hierarchy uh, that Paul gave us in Ephesians 6 and 12. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, we believers. Instead, what? We wrestle against what? Principalities, that's the high end, uh, 
uh, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. These are all spiritual ranking. But then they also have dominions and so all fine in Colossians 1 and whatever the case may be, right? So what, Daniel, if you're listening and you know the rules, here's what you're going to get from it. Because one would say, how come this angel that stood before God with this message was able to be subdued by this demonic force? Well, you would think that way when you have no respect for authority and ranking. Remember, the prince of Persia was a principality. The, the, the angel that Daniel spoke to was a messenger angel. Totally, this, this, this messenger is totally outright, even though the outright one is the demonic force. So you got to, listen, I cannot, I cannot emphasize this enough. That's why I tell you, read your Bible to understand. Read your, don't get all that garbage you hear over the years with foolishness. And read to understand. Say, Holy Spirit, teach me. Show me. Point out to me. So that explain. So watch this. There's a reason why I'm telling you this. So he says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia, which is the principality that rule over there, which stood me or delayed me or hindered me one and 20 days for 21 days, meaning the same time during his fast. But lo, watch this now. But lo, Michael, listen, one of the chief prince, and what is a prince again? One who rule a territory, in other words, a principality. So in order for the messenger angel to get the message to Daniel, to, to, to continue this journey on him, then you have to call equal power. Equal power in this sense, principality against principality. Huh? Michael the prince, or Michael the principality, is now contending with the Prince of Persia. So Michael came there, slap him up a couple of times, you know, punch him in the stomach a little bit, and say, go, 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 message angel. Let me finish deal with him while you take care of business. And yeah, I love it. I love it. Read the Bible for understanding. If say, God, right now, Father, continue to empower me with understanding. Get the garbage of sowing seed out of my head. Get the garbage of doing foolishness. It would have nothing to do with your word. And that's why I keep finding myself in this same circle. Because I'm trying to bribe you and listen to fools. Encourage me in this garbage. Help me to adhere to your laws. Help me to understand your rules. Help me to understand your protocols and your order and ranking and how to respect authority spiritually to know what I could and could not do. That's how you deal with this thing. That's how you deal with this. Love it. You should say, Lord, give me a passion for understanding. Give me a passion. Your word declares that, uh, uh, what it says now, not knowledge. Is it knowledge? Wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. And the word principal means voice and place. However, he says, in all thy getting, get what? Get an understanding. Because understanding is going to equip you on how to operate this knowledge you're coming into. Talk to me. I'm trying to help you. Okay, I'm telling you, man, people, don't please, please, for the love of God, don't fall into the trap next month. Don't fall into it again. Don't fall into the seed sowing and the fake prophecies and the lies. Don't fall. follow God's rules. That's it. So watch this. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and 20 days. This is not a human. This is not a human. If you said that was a human, how could a human being, if you want to call this the, the, the flesh and blood prince of Persia, how could a human being stop a messenger angel from God? When, again, I love rules. When I would have read in uh, Psalms 8, Verses four to six. It says, For what is man for thou art mindful of him? But a son of man that thou art visitest him. For he has made him, who is him? Same subject, man, a little lower than who? The angels. So if you still stick into the fact that the prince of points you here was a human being, how could the 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 sorry, how how could a man how how could that when we look at the order of it, how, how, how is it? The prince of Persia could stop the messenger angel when the Bible has made it clear in the rules that humans were made a little lower than the angels. Help me here. Help me. See, I love rules. 
I don't argue with fools. You know why? Because I'm encouraging them. I go with the rules. Now, if you could give me a rule that supersedes what I just said, then I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. I'm listening to you. I'm listening to you. So the scriptures are clear. So the prince of Persia is not a human being. The prince of Persia is the principality. And a principality is not a person, but it's a position that a prince holds, a chief angel prince hold over that territory. He says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief, one of the chief prince, okay? came to help and i always call him michael the uh minister of uh security he came to straighten things up okay one of the chief prince came to help me and i remained there with the kings with i remained there with the kings of persia so all those michael one was whooping the pants off of them while the messenger angel was free so verse 14 says now i this is still the messenger angel speaking to daniel now i am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I, Daniel, set my face towards the ground, and I, Daniel, became dumb. I couldn't speak. Verse 16 of Daniel 10. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. So not the same much of it and spoke and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision, my sorrow, my sorrows are turned unto, turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. I'm weak from all of these things, spiritual things that I'm experiencing. Verse 17, for how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? How is it possible for me as a flesh and blood human being to communicate but something I just read about, you, you are actually here in front of me, a spiritual being. This was Daniel's reaction. He says, well, how can the servant of this, my Lord, talk with this, my Lord? For as for me, straightway or immediately, there remained no strength in me. Neither is there any breath left in me. Because Daniel couldn't, couldn't come to the reality that I cannot believe I'm encountering a spiritual being from heaven that specifically came to me responding to my first. He said, I am weak. I have no breath to grasp this. Verse 18. Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man. And he strengthened me, same spiritual beings, and said, O man greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee. Be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Folks, I got to pause with you before I finish up. Are you seeing what is happening behind the scene? Are you taking note of it? Don't let no clown tell you. Oh, well, you're fasting, boy. Come on. I mean, everything breaking down on you. You can't see their sin in your life. They are ignorant. When you are ignorant to the rules, then you say ignorant things. When you are educated to the rules, you are more encouraged despite the opposition that come in your way because you've already concluded based on empirical evidence of scripture that the only reason why this this opposition is coming because my fast is eradicating evil powers. My fast is dispossessing them, meaning removing them from what they once called their territory, and I'm now taking rule over it. And that's why they're fighting, because it's so difficult to find another body to inhabit. So they're going to hold and claw onto me as much as they could and do their best to can kick over pots and pans to get my attention over there so that I'll focus more on the pots and pans than rather than focus on this beating I'm executing on them. The devil is a liar. I love scripture. I love it. I love it. Verse 20. Then said he, now remember, all of this is during the fast. Then said he, meaning the spiritual being, knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee. Now you know the reason why I came to you. And now will I return to fight? This is the spiritual being. He's saying, I'm not just going to shoot from the first heaven, the one that you could see. But when I get into that second heaven with Satan and his angels reside, I have to go back to fight just to get to the third heaven, the paradise of God. He says, then said he, which is the spiritual being, knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee. And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. Listen, listen. And when I am gone forth, Lo, the prince of Greece shall come. And what is this? You want to hear this? 
Let's look at that word reinforcement. To reinforce means to make something stronger or more pronounced. Okay, now let's look at the characters. Daniel, right, who was surrounded by some physical men, all right, went into this vision and he saw this being that he saw, he saw this being that was clearly not a human. There was an earthquake that took place during that period and the men took off running because they were afraid. But Daniel stayed there and submitted to this being. He became weak based on what he saw, all right? The being said to him, I was dispatched to you from the first day of your 21 day uh, fasting. However, the Prince of Persia, not a human, but a spiritual being, the Prince of Persia, Principality, withstood me, the messenger angel who came to give me a message. Therefore, I couldn't take him down. So one of greater power came, which is the Prince, one of many other Prince, this one was the Prince Michael came and subdued the Prince of Persia to allow me, the messenger angel, to come to you. So again, all we see is spiritual beings here. The spiritual being then downloaded the information that God gave him to give to Daniel. He's now advising Daniel that after this fast, because he already completed the 21 days, things are going to get worse. He's telling him. And how is it going to get worse first? Physically? No. He said, the initial rage of the it getting worse is going to begin spiritually. How do you know this, Kevin? Because the messenger angels say, when I leave, I have to go back and fight to get back to where I need to be. But let me put you on guard. The principality of Greece, the evil powers that rule there, is going to come here to Persia as reinforcement to the prince of Persia. In other words, things are going to get worse. But let's be clear. All of the bad and horrible stuff that will happen, it is as a result of the success of your fast, Daniel. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, your loving kindness, your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding. Father, I thank you that you're raising a generation who isn't into garbage seed sowing and buying miracles and buying oils and buying foolishness and never ever getting into the meat of your word, never ever getting into this is what I want to hear. This is what I want to practice. Father, gone are the days that we, the remnant, the up and coming believers of Jesus Christ, those of us who have had enough of the garbage, we say no more of that. We will not attend these, these, these bikers, these, these places where they're robbing and lying and giving false prophecies and replacing your word with material garbage. We ain't into that foolishness no more. We are done with that. We will not go into 2024 with the same defeated script. We are going to go according to your words. Now we know, Father God, that when it gets worse, this is when we rejoice. This is when we do card reels. Why? Because based on what we've read, according to your protocols and your rules, we are on the right path. We don't care how bad it gets after the fast. We don't care how bad it gets during the fast. We don't care about the opposition before the fast, because all of that is clear empirical evidence that we are on the right path. It is clear evidence that there are the, 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 the kingdom of heaven, our spiritual helpers have given TKOs to the kingdom of darkness. In fact, the fight is so intense that mommy acting up, wifey acting up, boss acting up, car breakdown. These are all the after effects. These are the tremors from the spiritual earthquake of the beaten that the kingdom of darkness is taking in the spiritual realm. So guess what? Now that I know that, okay, good. Thank you, Jesus. The car break down, Father, I give you the glory. She left me, Lord, I give you the praises because your word declares that First Thessalonians 5 and 18, and it says that we must give thanks, not in only the good things, not in some things, all things good, bad, and indifferent. Why? He says, because this is the will of God concerning us in Christ Jesus. So when the, the car break down, Father, I thank you for your will. When they say, Kevin, today is your last day on the job. Sorry is with short notice. Okay, sir, thank you very much for the opportunity. I give God the glory that you fired me today. I know this don't make sense to you, but I came into a revelation that when things are getting bad because I was fasting, and after the fast, it is an indicator I should have expected this. Now, while I'm giving you thanks there, sir, I am now open up to the possibilities of what's about to take place next. 
The breakthroughs are going to come, listen, one after the other. Why, Mr. Ewing? Because during the time I was getting all the bad news, during the time the car, the, the, the top, the stove, the dishwasher, and everything was going wrong, I wasn't speaking against myself. I wasn't complaining. I wasn't murmuring. And every one of them, even though I wanted to complain, even though I was tempted, I said, God, it don't make sense but I thank you that this washer isn't working. It don't make sense, but I give you the glory that I only got one more burner on these four burners on the stove. I give you the glory that even though my children isn't lining up the way that they should according to the will of God, I give you the glory because your word is clear because that's what I'm standing on. According to Proverbs 11 verse 21b, and it said that the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. Father, I cannot speak against what I'm praying for. I cannot speak against what I'm fasting for. I would be a fool, especially when I was decreed so many times. Death and life reside in the power of the tongue. A man shall eat good by the fruit of his lips. We are to call those things that be not as though they are. If we decree a thing, it shall be established. I would be a hypocrite that when these expected challenges came during and after the fast, only to succumb to the negative speaking, I would be a hypocrite. I would be a fool. I refuse to become a co-conspirator to the evil forces who are getting beat so bad that the only, only hope they get right now is that let's try to convince Kevin to help us. How? By getting him to speak against his destiny, getting him to speak against the word of God. Let him complain. Let's, let us get him to complain about how every time he put one foot forward, he got to take 10 back. Let him, let, him, let him go to that cliche garbage that if he spend one dollar, if he, if he save a dollar, he got to end up spending two. I know better now. Because I know better, I will do better. I don't care how much the licks come in. I don't care how painful they are. I don't care how much I made a mockery of. I am holding on to my faith which is the void of the living God. According to the book of Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1, it says that everything, including this beating that I can feel right now, including this, is only but for a time and a season. It cannot go on forever. Because I know that, I am going to speak, decree, and declare the word of God, despite and in spite what I see, what I hear, what I feel. And to help me in this, I'm cutting off every soul including family members, if they're speaking and doing opposite to what I'm believing. I don't hate you, but I got to make these sacrifices to be successful at the end of this journey. Father, we thank you. Father, we honor you. Father, we praise you. And we give you the glory for leaving our prayer according to your word that says whatsoever things we desire when we pray, we must believe that we have received it. And I do. And we shall have it in the matchless and in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. So that is it for me, folks. All right. Um, I'm going back to my regular schedule because, again, we're, I'm here at the Renew, Rebuild, and Restore conference here in Nassau. Actually, I'm here in my hotel room. We're going to have part two tonight on our topic, uh, identifying and addressing the invisible yokes uh, in your life. Excuse me, very, very powerful teaching. But also, our last session is tomorrow morning at 8.30. Okay, right after that, I'm going to have a book signing here in Nassau at the All Seasons Bookstore in Palmdale. Okay, I have that flyer on my web pages right now, my social media pages for the exact location, and that is going to be from 3 p.m. to 2 p.m. So if you have a book already, you can come there. If it was inside, I will sign it for you. And if you want to purchase a book, then you can come and get a copy. So I'll be at the All Seasons Bookstore in Nassau Bounds tomorrow. Uh, we can come and get that done. Now, tomorrow, we're going to have a question and answer period, okay? It's going to be very intense. And all of my teachings, I always uh, require that we have that because there's so many revelations that people coming to, and they just little, need a little bit more understanding. So we're going to allot that time tomorrow, beginning at 8.30 tomorrow morning. If you haven't gotten your tickets or whatever's yet, please go and get it. Again, all of the information is on my page for those of you who are in Nassau already. And you can come and cash in on this. God bless you, okay? And you have a wonderful and blessed afternoon.